Symbiodinium is the genus of ubiquitous dinoflagellates, commonly referred to as zooxanthellae, which is just a general term for brown round cells in the tissues of marine organisms. I'm going to delve a little deeper into the life cycle of this algal genus and the role it plays in the aquatic environment. Symbiodinium is a hot topic in the global warming discussion because the loss of these symbiotic organisms in coral tissues leads to coral bleaching and potentially coral death. Let's get started. First I think it's important to discuss what symbiosis means. It can include anything from parasitic to mutualistic relationships, meaning it doesn't necessarily have to be a positive interaction for both organisms. The interaction also has to be between two different species that survive together for long, long periods of time. The majority of what I'll be discussing is called photosymbiosis, and that's the use of microalgal cells as solar panels for collecting light. This type of symbiosis is what is theorized to give rise to the chloroplast and is found widely in both aquatic and terrestrial environments. The host organisms generally makes use of the photosynthate produced by the microalgae and the algal cells live comfortably in a nice nutrient rich home. So it's considered mutualistic for both species. These algal symbionts were first studied in lichens, a fungal and algae composite organism, and cnidarias, like corals, with their symbiodinium, which I'll be discussing. Now, what are some of the advantages of this symbiotic relationship between symbiodinium and their host? The major advantage for the host is that this photosymbiosis allows them to live in oligotrophic waters and reach large size that would not be possible without the energy input from their symbionts. This allows for beautiful large species like the giant clam and extensive coral reefs that tourists enjoy looking at while they're swimming in the crystal clear nutrient poor water. However, Symbiodinium has the advantage of living out its life in an organism protected from microalgal predators having their dreams of sedentary life met with nutrient transport from the host. Initially, it was thought to be a single worldwide species because they're mostly nondescript brown coccoid circular cells, as seen here. They receive their brown color from their accessory pigments diatoxanthin and peridinin. They range from 5 to 15 microns and have both free living and in symbio non modal forms. I'll go into a little more detail about this later. Symbiodinium was first described in the jellyfish Cassiopeia zamachana by Dr. Frudenthal. And this is the genus of upside down jellyfish as seen here. As you can see, there's a dense population of symbiodinium in the tissues, given the brown color, and it's quite beautiful. It's worth noting that even though a lot of symbiodinium species can look similar, they are quite diverse and create symbiotic relationships with a variety of different organisms. This includes mollusks, jellyfish, flatworms, corals, and anemones. This figure shows the phyla that the different clades of symbiodinium form partnerships with. The earliest clade, clade A, seen here, appeared 65 to 50 million years ago and is distributed widely through many different species. However, some of the branches can specialize to certain phylum as seen in clade I, which is only in foraminifera. It's worth noting that are, there are many subclades and species in these clade groupings. On the species level, they can be very specific to certain hosts. These hosts represent different niches to which the symbiodinium can evolve and specialize, since they are, since they are unique for each organism. For the purposes of our discussion, a lot of the examples will be from the symbiodinium's relationship with coral since this relationship is widely studied for its importance in coral reef ecosystems. Here's the geographic distribution of symbiodinium across the Earth. As you can see, the highest diversity is in the Indo-Pacific and Caribbean. The temperate zones show less diversity, most likely due to lack of host organisms in these areas. The observations of symbiodinium's life cycle were mostly from cultured organisms taken out of their coral host. 
There are two primary forms, and both are unarmored or athecate. There is a modal flagellated gymnodinium or bilobed cell that is used for dispersal and quick infection of the host cell. The primary form for mitosis and symbiosis is the coccoid cell seen here. And this coccoid cell results when the gymnoid cell goes under a quick transformation and loses its flagella and then turns into this circular cell. Fun fact, the non-modal form is the only form that perf performs mitosis, which is quite different than most dinoflagellate species. Also, Symbiodinium does something really cool. The mitotic stages are on a diel cycle where the coccoid cell divides its nucleus in the dark. Then the cell divides soon after the light reaches the cell, releasing two of the modal cells during the daytime. Towards the end of the day, these modal cells will transform into the coccoid cell as previously mentioned. This is interesting because the symbiodinium's full life cycle is, has a lot of uncertainties. The genetic diversity suggests sexual reproduction slash recombination, but has yet to be witnessed, as well as tetrad cells made by meiosis, but these are all inferred and haven't been empirically seen. Coral larvae have the capacity of obtaining symbiodinium before they settle as juveniles. I won't go into the coral life stages, but it's important to note that the corals in their larval stage have phagocytic cells that are able to capture free living symbiodinium. There is a higher diversity and density of symbiodinium in the sediments of reef systems due to the negative buoyancy of symbiodinium. So the larvae have, have been shown to travel to the sediment to, and have a higher chance of getting the best suited algae for the job. Thus having an array of symbiodinium initially can give them a competitive advantage for the environment they live in. This process is known as horizontal transmission, as opposed to vertical transmission, which would be the transfer of the symbiont from the parent corals to their offspring. Upon contact with the phagocytic cells of the corals, the glycans on the symbiodinium, as seen here, interact with the lectins on the cell of, of the coral, and then they attach and the symbiodinium is engulfed. As mentioned before, numerous corals pick up a diverse array of symbiodinium, so these glycans are probably hi highly conserved among most symbiodinium species. Here's an example of where symbiodinium makes its home, inside the polyp of a coral. They reside inside the oral endoderm, inside of vacuoles aptly named symbiosomes. They are represented by these green little blobs here. These Symbiosomes are no luxury apartment, but they have just enough room to house small dinoflagellates. Here is a picture of a freeze fractured SEM of a coral polyp. I always think it's beneficial to see these electron micrographs to give a better perspective on what the actual system looks like. The process of nutrient exchange is rather complex, but it's the job of the host cell to bring in CO2 into the cell from the external environment where it's primarily in the form of bicarbonate. It's interesting because usually for animals, CO2 is transported out of the system as a product of respiration. However, research su suggests that the host and symbiodinium control the pH around the membranes using H or hydrogen ATPase to transform bicarbonate into carbonic acid, then using carbonic anhydrase around the membranes that can change this carbonic acid rapidly into CO2 where it can cross the cell membrane easily. And then as it crosses the, the membrane of the photosymbiont, it can be taken up by Rubisco that has a high affinity for CO2. Besides CO2 transfer, the host supplies the symbiodinium with phosphate, nitrogen, and other nutrients necessary so the little algae can produce essential amino acids, glucose, and other products that the coral can use. The symbiodinium also produce mycosporine-like amino acids that can protect the coral cells from UV radiation. And although the process is still being studied, it appears that the photosymbionts also help in the calcification process. The breakup, or coral bleaching. 
This process is the loss of photosynthetic pigments or of the symbiodinium themselves. It is believed to be a combined effect of high light intensity and high temperatures that leads to this detrimental effect. This is because the high light intensity causes photo inhibition or damage to the photosystem 2 proteins. However, there are repair processes mediated by the protein D1 which is synthesized as a response to this photosystem damage. And there's possibly other processes, but this is the most studied. These processes keep the photosystem 2 working properly under low temperature conditions. However, under high temperature stressful conditions, this repair process is inhibited by both the production of oxygen radicals by photosystem 1 and the temperature itself. The host has to respond to these oxygen radicals and lack of carbon fixation from the symbiodinium, so it releases it by a number of mechanisms including programmed cell death or apoptosis, necrosis, exocytosis, or just pinching off of the host cell. Whatever the mechanism, the host must rid itself of the dysfunctional symbiont with hopes of acquiring more temperature resistant symbionts from the environment. Or the coral can also just wait until temperature decreases and they can reuptake the symbionts and hopefully recover from the environmental stress. But this can take months or years, so it's very detrimental. There's still a lot of unanswered questions about these algal symbionts and how they may adapt to global changes in temperature and ocean acidification. The more researchers can understand these complex relationships, the better chance we have to help mitigate the damage to these illustrious ecosystems. Thank you.